Hi, good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining me. Um, this is a very important discussion, and I'll be, as usual, going through a presentation for those who are with me on the webinar where we'll be breaking down each section and then taking questions afterwards. Now, temporarily, um, for those who are on YouTube, just in the first steps, first stage, as usual, I let you join in with me temporarily. And then after that's finished, then I would go into the webinar with the people who have registered. That's where they'll be able to ask questions. And I've been hesitating to do this presentation because it's big. It is, um, it, it's essentially just to give you an idea as to what I'm trying to put together here. Um, this is the um, overview that I've put together. And even then, this is the draft overview. And I'll be running through. This section here is about the viruses and variants. I'll be looking at characteristics of the immune system. I'll be looking at upper airway, why it's so important and why it's been overlooked. Um, the autoimmune response, this is where my focus comes in. Um, talking about the characteristics, unusual symptoms around COVID, um, the issues with regards to vaccines, and then clinical disease presentations. So this is the full overview of what I'm planning to do. So today I'm just doing this section here because it's such an important area to cover, meaning that it, nothing makes sense if you don't get those basics right. And so this is what I'm focused on at the moment, is just getting those basics right. So for those people who want to register for this Advanced 360, my view is that if I don't do it now, it will only get harder to do. And so I was going through a recent um, text that somebody had put together. I looked at what they had. I thought about what I thought was missing um, in terms of making sense of the pandemic. So there is a lot of detail out there. And uh, there's a huge textbook that was um, done by Professor Hasseltine, which I thought was very valuable. The problem is, is that I'm trying to see if I can pick out from it the context of what's important so that people then understand how to approach the disease and critically, what's going to happen next. And for those people who have been listening to GERT, you'll realize that this is very, very important. And so the context, as I said, about the Advanced 360 is putting across the whole pandemic and what has happened from my clinical and autoimmune perspective in a way that hopefully should make sense to the people who listen to it. Um, so as I said, if you're interested in registering for that, the uh, discounted prices in the description as the weeks go by and I build it out because I'll be trying to do this over the next two to three months to have it all completed, the price goes up because there's much more content. So yes, yeah, so now we're going to just go into uh, the different sections and modules or the parts. And as I said, the first part I'll do with everybody here. And then after that, it will only be for the people who have registered for the, um, for the webinar. So in the first part here of Advanced 360, my aim is just to deal with some basic concepts around viruses and the variants associated with SARS-CoV-2. I think it's very important to get that baseline in place because it can be very confusing if you don't quite understand about viruses. Now, there's a lot of talk going on around now whether or not viruses even exist. I am going from the presumption and the scientific presumption that what we have studied with virology is very important. And critically, if we don't understand viruses, there are many diseases that are very relevant that can get out of control. And so with regards to the starting point here, as I said, an understanding of how SARS-CoV-2 operates is critical to understanding the characteristics of disease as well as targeting treatment. 
I'll be covering in this, as I said, the basics of a virus, very basic view. Then I'll be doing a comparison with the COVID epidemic and prior viral epidemics, including like influenza, just a chart to give you an idea. I've added in here the interferon response to the virus because this is such a critical part as to how this virus operates, different from others. And that interferon response is exceptionally important to understand why we are seeing the disease the way we are. And then finally, I'll be talking about the different variants, why that's relevant to understand in terms of the differences between Omicron and the earlier variants. And at the end, I'll be doing a discussion about gain of function and why it's important. Because if you don't understand the gain of function, then you really will struggle with trying to grasp why the disease is, is, is operating in such an unusual fashion. So firstly, a virus is a microscopic infectious agent. You can only see it under an electron microscope, not under a normal microscope, and it can only replicate inside the living cells of an organism, different from a bacteria that can replicate outside of the cell and they can grow on their own on an agar plate. A virus has to be inside a living cell, and it can be containing genetic material, either DNA or RNA, and there are different types of that, but for simplicity, we'll just break it into DNA and RNA, and it's surrounded by a protein coat called a capsid. So that's essentially what a virus is. And I've got this image here, which is showing the different sizes approximately. And I've put this together. And you can see here, this is a size about of a coronavirus, which is 0.1 micrometers. Bacteria is about 0.5, so about five times larger, depending on the type of bacteria it is. Red blood cell is eight uh, micrometers, so it's significantly bigger. And then I've put a macrophage here, which is about 21 micrometer. So you can see that the virus is tiny, but you know, what happens is once it gets inside a cell, it can then replicate multiple thousands, thousands, uh, millions of viral particles can be produced over time. And so it's a very productive kind of infection. Again, just to understand simply the cell structure, I've got here two different types of cells or two cells, just one here, this is a cell with all the organelles involved. And you can see this here is the nucleus, rough endoplasmic reticulum, smooth endoplasmic reticulum where they make the proteins. You have lysosomes, you have mitochondria. So there are all kinds of parts in terms of a cell. But to simplify it, I just need you, certainly in the viral context, to just think of nucleus. That's where all of the nuclear material is, is held that causes, allows a cell to replicate, and the cytoplasm. That's where most of the work of the cell occurs. That's where energy is produced and proteins and so on are made. So for the simplicity, just understand that, and it's relevant in the context of the virus. Again, you have multiple types of viruses, and I've got here just a small selection of some of them. You can see here, this is SARS-CoV-2, this is an influenza virus. This is a Zika virus. You have here a rhinovirus, a porcine virus, Epstein-Barr. And what I've labeled here is what type. So most of these at the top are all RNA viruses, including MERS and respiratory syncytial virus, RSV. And DNA viruses down here, Epstein-Barr is one significant one. It's very broadly infected across most of the Western world. Um, porcine parvovirus is another example of a DNA virus. And again, and this is just to break down the simple concept as to what really happens with regards to a virus. Why are they DNA versus RNA? So I've just given a little summary as to why you have these differences. What are the advantages? So the DNA virus tends to be more stable. It has proofreading mechanisms. Therefore, it doesn't have replication errors or minimizes them. 
and it can integrate into the host genome. That means in the DNA, once it gets inside the nucleus, it can then integrate in it and continue to replicate for long periods of time as long as the cell remains alive. The disadvantage is it's bigger and there are a limited range of, of hosts that it can infect, so meaning that if it is a human DNA virus, it will tend to only infect humans as opposed to infecting different animals and so on. And this is what it could look like. This is an example of a DNA virus, which is hepatitis B. And you can see here, the virus here is entering the cell, binds to a receptor. All of them bind to a receptor. This is the lock key mechanism. They use different receptors in order to get in. This one here, it gets inside and then the DNA of the virus is then taken, chaperoned into the nucleus. It then unpacks. It then starts using the cellular um, DNA transcription to produce RNA, which then makes another virus, and then out it comes at the other side. So this is the mechanism, just a simple mechanism as to how a DNA virus operates. And as I said, this is the simplistic guide, and it's relevant in what I am saying, and that's why I'm mentioning it, just to give you an overview of the points. However, what about the RNA virus? So the RNA viruses, their advantages are that they have much more rapid evolution with very high mutation rates. Unlike DNA, which tries to conserve exactly what was in the DNA to keep it exactly the same or close to it, the RNA viruses are rapidly evolving with very high mutation rates, which means that they are much more flexible and they replicate much faster. But the disadvantage is that they are unstable and therefore also the immune response towards the viruses can sometimes be stronger. And so this is why you would see an Epstein-Barr virus, it's much more difficult for the immune system to get rid of it. Uh, conversely, in most RNA viruses, cold virus, even influenza virus, the immune response can usually get on top of it relatively quickly. And this is now an example of how that works. And so this is the RNA virus entering an exit. And so you can see here, this is the coronavirus. It binds to the receptor, which here is ACE2. It then allows it to get inside the cell. It then unpacks the RNA right in the cytoplasm. That's why I showed the picture of the cell. So it doesn't need to go in the nucleus. This is why it has greater speed. Unpacks it right there, unpacks the proteins, immediately starts to make proteins. It uses the mechanisms, the protein uh, making machinery in the cell to repackage new viruses and there it goes. So the RNA virus has a much faster cycle in and out uh, because it doesn't need to go in the nucleus. And that's one of the advantages, which is why it's able to spread so far and so wide. And so there is the first section. So the aim here is to understand how SARS-CoV-2 operates as a virus, and it's critical to understanding the characteristics of the disease as well as targeting treatment. So again, for those who are on YouTube, thank you for joining me. I hope that you found this valuable. If you're interested in the details of the full course, please register before the price goes up. The, um, it is in the description. And I look forward to sharing some more uh, information with you soon. Have a good evening.